Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Wine Wednesday. I'm Kevin Addix with the Maryland Wineries Association. Uh, excited to to have uh, a couple of guests on, which we'll we'll jump to in just a moment. Um, today's topic is about our Wine Explorer program, and uh, you heard from Jana Howley a couple of weeks ago about uh, what we're doing and, and some of the great wines we have. Uh, I'm going to give just just one more reminder about the program, and then want to jump into highlighting one of the wines in each of the packs because we're 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 really thrilled with the interesting varieties and styles that we've got in these packs. Um, and uh, Carrie, how you doing? Um, so uh, let's let's jump into that. Let me see if I can if I can share. So I think you can see that. Um, so this is this is our Wine Explorer Club. So if you go to MarylandWine.com slash Explorer, you can check out uh, what we've got. And, and the premise is that um, you're interested in some great Maryland wine. Uh, we've got some leads on some really incredible wines. Uh, and in many cases, wines that you, you know, they may have been off your radar uh, or the wineries you may have never even heard of. So we're getting some exclusive wines. We've got one in the red pack that um, is just not available to the public. You can't buy it. You can't buy it anywhere except through this pack. So we'll we'll talk about those in a moment. And there are a, a couple of ways that you can be involved. The first is um, you can just come on our website four times a year when we're offering these packs uh, for, for sale to the public and you can just buy it. And there's a price on there. Uh, about what you can buy. You can buy the red pack, the white pack, or uh, one of our specialty packs. And this month we've got a Maryland Heritage pack, which we're uh, really excited to talk about because it's uh, it's super cool wine that that uh, kind of goes way back and tells a story about kind of the history of, of Maryland wine. Um, and there, like I said, there are two ways to buy it. You can either buy it outright or you can join the club and just have these shipped to you automatically four times a year. Um, we're switching up the varieties. We're switching up the wines. And the good news is if you do subscribe, you not only get uh, the benefit of a discount, but you do get a flat rate shipping. So if you wanted to come back when we send you notice saying, hey, we're, we're, about, to, uh, we're about to get this going, uh, what are you interested in? Um, if you bought a white pack and you subscribe to a white pack, but you say, hey, the red pack looks pretty cool or the heritage pack looks pretty cool or the Thanksgiving pack from, from last November looks cool. Uh, you get free shipping and uh, not free shipping. You get um, standard uh, rate shipping. So it's, it's a it's a level fee. Um, and then we do offer some other discounts as we go through and uh, we're excited about it. And the feedback that we're getting is great because there are wines that uh, are just not generally available. Um, and I'll, I'll dive into this white pack for a moment. And uh, while we've got this on the screen, um, I'm going to bring up Bob White, who's joining us from Robin Hill Vineyard. Bob, thanks. Thank you, Kevin. So I, I took you away from farm duties. I apologize. You were talking to me uh, pregame about, um, you know, <laughs> managing your standard farm fare. Um, tell us just real quick, what's, what's happening with, uh, with the winery and with the vineyard at this very moment? Uh, right now at the winery, um, our, our weekend hours are weather dependent. Uh, <laughs> if it's going to snow, it's going to cause a hazard to our customers. Uh, we just assume stay closed for those uh, snow days. And um, we don't want anybody uh, getting hurt trying to get out there. Um, where we have our shipping online now. So if you want your wine, we can ship it to you. Um, and the things, uh, we're done with our cold stabilization back in the cellar. Uh, we've started some of our blendings and um, the wines, uh, considering the, the growing year that we had, um, I'm a little more happy now after the cold stabilization is over and we're starting to do the blendings. Uh, I still think we're gonna have some pretty decent wines uh, considering our uh, 2020 growing season was a disaster, but um, we pulled it off. We pulled it off. Some, some neat seller yep. gets us through. Can, can I ask you? So, so by now, so we're we're what we're we're between three and four months past harvest. Right. Um, by now, you you can tell what these wines are going to be. 
you can tell what's good, what's best, what's, you know, reserve, what's. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a fairly good idea. Um, you know, they're uh, looking at their, their, their body, their hue, their, their uh, aroma, um, some taste. Uh, they're starting to, to come in, especially the whites. You know, the whites always develop uh, earlier and uh, the, uh, the reds take a little more time. Obviously, they need to age, but um, you can tell whether it's going to age out well or if it's something we're going to need to uh, move out quick. So, um, yeah, at this point, we can make some uh, fairly, fairly good uh, estimates of, of what we're uh, expecting to have this year. Great. Well, um, the reason you're on, not just because uh, we, we love having you involved and we're, we're loving Robin Hill and what you guys are doing down there. Um, your, one of your wines is selected in this white pack. And uh, there's a couple things that's cool about it. Um, number one, the name is great. Uh, number two, you are still in the scheme of things, a relatively new winery on the scene uh, in the history of Maryland wines. So we're thrilled to have you on. And, and I think most exciting for me, um, I think you might be the first one to come out with a straight Chenin Blanc in the state. It's, it's very possible. Um, I know there are a couple other growers. Uh, I know Big Cork was, was playing with it, but they got hit hard with some uh, winter damage. Um, I don't know if they actually released the Chenin Blanc or if they're blending it. Um, but yeah, our Chenin Blanc is, is doing well. That was actually one of my first um, wines that I made as a as an amateur winemaker, I, I bought a wine kit with a Chenin Blanc, so it's always kind of stuck with me. As uh, I want to make this one day, I want to grow it one day. So we had the opportunity here to uh, expand the vineyard. We wanted to put in another white, uh, another white wine. Um, didn't want to stick with what everybody else was growing. We wanted to try something different. So uh, did a little research, talked with Joe Fiola about uh, the Chenin Blanc. Um, with its success in uh, South Africa and the uh, the climates there and our climates here. So we figured, what the heck, we try it. So we have 450 vines in the ground. It's, uh, the, it grows fantastic. It's, uh, it's a nice, vigorous. Um, it it bud, breaks bud early, so we got hit with frost this year with it. It was our first, first uh, green out and the first one to get burned off. Um, but it, uh, it it's resilient. It came back. And... Um, so we've, we're averaging about 10 pounds per vine. Uh, so we're getting about two tons a year. So that's, that's enough to make what, we're, what we need to do with it uh, for our small lots. Well, we do small lots of everything. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great wine. It's very smooth. The aromatics are just incredible. Uh, so we made it uh, off dry. So I wanted just a little touch of sweetness to it. Um, so we already have, you know, three dry whites. I didn't want one more dry white and didn't want another sweet white. So we just, I mean, it's about 1% residual sugar. So it's just got a little hint of sweetness. It really goes nice with the with the green apple and the nectarine. Yeah, it's uh, very so fruity. That. And um, yeah, it's uh, flying off the shelf too. So it's, it, 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 it talks for itself. Well, that's great. So, so um, I've loved Chenin Blanc over the years and, you know, the, the French versions, of course, California throws in a few, as noted here, uh, South Africa, uh, as you mentioned, has really taken off with uh, Chenin Blanc and, and turned what, you know, many folks over the years had, had considered to be kind of a secondary grape back into the star that it, it should be. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that this, that, you know, you and Dave Collins and at, at Big Cork and some of the other folks who are trying this that it's going to be a long lasting variety. Cause I think, you know, with its aromatics and its body and just the, the very fruit forwardness, it, it fills a hole. I mean, it's a great, it's a great spot in the lineup. Right. So. Right. And uh, yeah, our, our guests, uh, our first uh, vintage, we only got like 30 gallons, you know, it was like year two, just playing with it. It was gone in a month. So, Oh, okay. We got, we got a hot one on our hands here. Uh, and last year we, we, uh, Brought in two tons, and uh, that's you know three quarters gone now. Um, so we're waiting for the uh, twenty twenty to come around. Uh, even with our uh, the bad growing season we had this year, uh, being this is of an infra, and we're down here in southern Maryland where it's we had over twenty five inches of rain in August and September, and our humidity um, it's prone to rot. 
So we did have to deal with a with a lot of rot this year. Um, our our field our harvesting crews were uh, exceptional with the the field cleaning of the fruit. Um, then we did some uh, uh, preparations at the at the crush pad to uh, deal with any other uh, rot that we had there, and um, it has now settled out nicely and it's it's looking great. So I have a lot of uh, a lot of confidence that our 2020 uh, route is going to be uh, as good, if not better, than the 2019. So you, you you mentioned rot, and I had someone when I was giving a presentation once say, "Why why do you people keep bringing up rot when we're talking about vines and grapes and just how how great your wine's supposed to be?" And you and you mentioned rot, and I, I remind folks, a it's an agricultural product, right? So you're you're growing something and you're dealing with what nature gives you, and and you're you know the the magic. I don't know if it's magic, it's skill to go through and, and make sure that you're using only the ripest, you know, cleanest berries in the wine production. Right. Um, and, and then getting rid of the stuff that, you know, isn't up to par. And that's, that's what makes, that's, that's the difference between a good winery and a great winery is the attention to that detail. So yes, we talk about rot, but we talk about rot because, you know, we're dealing with an agricultural product. We're not, you know, ordering up concentrate and shaking it up and it's the same right. every time it's it's not easy but we're easy everybody would do it that's for sure <laughs> yeah uh, um, growing we, the fruit, uh, takes a lot of a lot of work uh, especially when you're dealing with uh with the vinifera down here in this climate uh, our canopy management is uh i'll say near to excellent uh we, we have a really good program uh, good good folks taking care of our vines and um you know if the fruit isn't isn't right it's on the ground you know as uh, much as it breaks your heart to have to do it you know you either want a good bottle of wine uh that's that's going to uh, maintain a, a certain level of expectation um and that's what we shoot for every year is to maintain that uh level of uh the shelves being emptied well that's good yeah yeah and uh drop that fruit and feed the turkeys um so, Bob, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the other wines here and then uh, jump to our next guest. So thank you, and I hope people – I know people will enjoy this wine. Great. Yeah, we, we, we're very confident that they will uh, drink that and uh, want more. <laughs> well, good. Say, say hi to the rest of the team there. Will do, Kevin. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you for all you do. As always, happy to do it, especially when there's good wine involved. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. So um, running through the other two wines in this pack, so uh, Birchview is a rather new entrant on the scene in Maryland uh, and actually is managing, took over a vineyard that Bob White, our former guest, um, you know, just, just recent prior guest, used to manage and used to own. So uh, Bob's kind of heritage up in Carroll County is continuing with uh, the Mushaws, who are managing Birchview Vineyard and have produced a couple of really interesting wines. One of them being Pinot Grigio, which has a, a uh, long history in Maryland. It's not one of the original varieties that was grown here, but it's one that uh, has done very, very well. And as anyone who drinks Pinot Grigio knows, it can make a variety of different styles. Um, this one is, you know, kind of, as it says right here, the classic crisp, uh, I would almost say exactly spot on the Italian style. Um, Pinot Grigio can can be rounder and richer and and you can put it in barrels and everything else but this one is is a straight up classic crisp and it's a beautiful wine and it's a winery that most folks have uh yet to visit and and yet to have heard from and then we jump down to montgomery county uh where we've got rockland farm which is uh, in poolsville uh very close to uh, the potomac and uh, again beautiful wine this one is chardonnay which is a uh a, uh, a hybrid grape uh, blend of, and it's got a little bit of uh, Saval and Chardonnay put into it. Chardonnay has been promoted in Maryland as a, a great alternative to some of the other kind of standard whites. And we're starting to see Chardonnay really take off. And we're starting to see um, late harvest Chardonnay and sparkling Chardonnay. And this one is a really beautiful, aromatic, um, uh, but still light wine, wine, light white wine, and it's almost got this, um, you know, uh, slight green hue to it. So a really, really cool wine, 2019, um, estate grown. And so we've got uh, wine from Southern Maryland, Prince George's County. We've got a wine from 
uh, Montgomery County, and we've got one from Carroll County. It's one of the things I love about this pack is, um, and, and just the concept of these Explorer packs is, you're getting to taste the state. Um, and uh, we're already thinking about what's going to be in the next packs, but we really, really encourage you to check this out. So jumping over to the red pack, um, we've got a guest in here that I'd like to bring up, and it is William Layton, who's been on here before. William, welcome. Hi, Kevin. How you doing? I'm, I'm very well. Um, so before we jump into the wine, uh, t tell us tell us kind of the daily gig at, uh, at Layton's Chance. What's happening this week there? Um, well, uh, in the back here, um, we're about six weeks away from bottling. So we're doing a lot of uh, cold stabilization and filtering and uh, getting the wines ready to go. Uh, up in the front, it's uh, Valentine's Day. So we've got a big pairing going on, chocolate and wine pairing that we're getting ready for this weekend if the snow doesn't mess it all up. <laughs> and and that, that is our reminder if you have forgotten that this is the week. Valentine's Day is indeed upon us. So uh, get, get some wine, get some chocolate, or maybe just get some wine <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and settle in as it, as we may get some snow. Um, so you're, you're close to bottling and bottling isn't just a flip the switch kind of thing. You gotta, you, you gotta get the wines ready. You gotta make sure all of your, uh, you know, the, the, the hoses and filters and everything else are ready to go. Do you have your own bottling line? I don't. And, and uh, I bring in a mobile yep. bottling line, and that means I have to have all my wines ready at one time, ready to go. And I've got uh, nine different wines that I'm bottling this time, and so I have to have them all filtered and stable, and the sweetness and the acidity and everything ready right at the same time when the bottling line gets here for uh, for them to go. They're not waiting for me. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, because time is money. Um, yeah. So, well, that, that's great. And uh, good luck with all the bottling and getting the wines prepped. Um, one of your wines is included in our red wine pack, and that's the Layton's Chance Winery. Let me, let me shine that up here so you can see. <laughs> the Vintner's Reserve, um, yeah. which beautiful, you know, dark bottle, black label. Um, this is something you've put probably your most time and effort into. Tell us about it. So the Vintner's Reserve is just really great because – um, it's a 2018 vintage and 2018 was actually our worst year ever in the vineyard. It was our, our lowest crop level. It was, it was the worst overall quality, um, because we just had so much rain. It, it rained like 26 out of 30 days in September. It just kept raining and raining and raining. Um, and, and so you, you don't expect great wines to come out of that, but this is a wine that did, um, uh, it's a blend of our our Cabernet Franc and our Norton. Um, it was actually the very first year we had gotten a crop off Cabernet Franc. Um, and so we didn't have a whole lot of it. Um, we only had about one ton, uh, which really wasn't enough to make the kind of batch I wanted. So what I decided to do is is what we call field blending. And that just means mixing it together in the crusher to stemmer with something else. Uh, usually we like to, to ferment them separately, see what we end up with, and then do blending afterwards. But uh, when you don't have much of it, you field blend, you just throw it all in there together and see what you come out with. So we, we put in uh, a one ton of, of the Cabernet Franc that we had and a ton of our Norton, um, uh, which is, is a grape I really like and I thought would pair real well with it. And uh, we, we fermented that and... After it got done fermentation, I tasted it and I said, that, that seems pretty good. And, and about a month later, I tasted it and I said, that's really, really good. <laughs> about a month later, I said, I think this really has the potential to be a great wine for us. Um, and that's, that's why I put uh, kind of my name on there, Vintner's Reserve, because um, even at that point, uh, I, uh, I was so impressed with it. I thought this is really going to be one of the best wines I've ever made. Um, we aged it on, on oak for a little bit. We do oak chips instead of oak barrels, um, but we put it on there uh, with the oak. Um, doesn't have any sweetness at all to it. And it just, just really turned into a good wine for us. 
Um, I'm always fascinated by by that, and I was, uh, you know, kind of referring uh, to this with with Bob earlier. But I'm always fascinated by you know the tasting and the retasting, and and when a winemaker has that moment when they say this this one this one is <laughs> the reserve or this one is the you know extra 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 whatever it is um and i know that you don't start thinking pricing till later on but you know <laughs> when it, when is that moment and and you you tasted it at what point you know how long ago or how long into the process was it that you tasted it and said this is going to be special was it so, a year in six months in um um it, it it's tough it, it the wine certainly continually changes um usually about uh five months in or so uh it certainly is not the wine it's going to be but i've got a pretty good feel for this has has a lot of potential this is going to turn into a great wine uh, this is a good wine. I, I've got a feel af after about five month, five to six months for where I think it's going to end up. Um, and that's just a, a matter of, uh, with, with winemaking and tasting, it's doing it over, over time. I've been a winemaker for um, 12 years now. And so, you know, tasting them every year. And then I, I keep a library so I can go back and taste my old wines, see how they develop. And you start to get a feel for that what I tasted here versus where I know where, where wines in the past have ended up. Um, I start to get a pretty good idea of, of at, at five months, I can tell what's going to turn into a, a really nice wine and, and what's going to be, you know, your basic table wine or, or, uh, or a good wine. And, th and that's part of the artistry of, of coming up with your line of wines. You, you've got a whole bunch of wines uh, uh, on your, kind of in your portfolio. And it, it's great for someone yeah. who may not know what they want to try. Uh, Layton's has something literally for everybody in your lineup. So I, I commend you. We, on we've that. got a lot of different wines. I, I like having different wines for, for when, when people come in and, and say, uh, I don't know what I want. I got something for you. I don't know what it is yet, but I got something there. <laughs> Um, tell me just, just briefly uh, your experience with Norton. So is it something that, that, you know, is going to be with you in your lineup for a while? Is it, is it a grape that you're really invested in? Cause it's I'm not a, very common. It's not very common. I'm a big fan of Norton. Um, I, I first tasted it in Virginia. Um, and even in Virginia, it's, it's a native grape to Virginia. Not a lot of wineries there do uh, grow Norton, but, but uh, a few of them, a number of them do. Um, I'm the only one in Maryland. I, I think there's a couple that make a Norton wine. I'm the only one I know of that grow Norton here. I really like it. It's, it's tough. Even though it's a native grape, it, it resists disease real well. So it's easy to take care of in that sense. Um, but they're really, they're different than all my other grapes. They're really tiny berries. Um, it's hard to get good yields out of it and good, um, a quantity of juice. It makes such a nice wine to me. It's got great color. It's got great body. Um, it tastes different. It's what we call, what we like to call earthy. <laughs> and and when they're young, uh, my staff likes to call them muddy. <laughs> um, I I, I but, know that. I know that flavor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it takes more aging than other wines do. Um, but I really like it, and and it's great because it's a wine that has somewhat of a cult following. I've, I've had a number of people come in specifically looking for the Norton and they go around tasting different Nortons um, that are real fans of it. Ten, people tend to either love it or hate it. Um, I know a lot of people really don't like it. It, it is, does have a different taste. Um, I just in the last couple of years, really starting with this one, have started blending the Norton more and more. Um, it is It has worked really well in the Vintners Reserve there. Um, and I've, I've been adding more and more of it to my farm red, which is kind of our basic table wine, um, kind of the workhorse of our, our dry reds. Um, and, and it's, I definitely want to keep that. It's a great wine, great, great for us. Well, um, William wanted to thank you for joining us and, and thanks, thanks for sharing this wine with us. I know, um, sometimes it's hard to pry some of the premium wines out of our <laughs> winemakers sellers, but, uh, appreciate this. And. For folks who haven't tried it, it's it's a great 
primer on on both Norton and Cab Franc because you can you can see both of them, you can taste both of them, um, but it's really the blend that makes it makes it all come together and win. So, William, thanks, and say hi to everybody there. We'll do that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, two other wines that are in this this wine pack. So we've got uh, the the red wine pack. We've got Urban Winery out of uh, Silver Spring, Montgomery County, again, um, with their Bourbon Barrel Merlot. And I've got a bottle of that here, which I will shine up to show folks. So it's a, it's a you know, your typical Merlot, the difference being it's been aged in a bourbon barrel. And what's really interesting with that is it brings out a whole variety of additional flavors. And um, if you've got a Merlot that's been aged in your standard, you know, French or American oak, um, open that up and try it with this. And if you know anything about bourbon, you can smell and you can taste and begin to feel some of those aromas and some of those um, tannins that are coming specifically from the bourbon infused barrel. So it's, it's a very fun wine, a very cool wine. Um, and uh, uh, got to thank the folks at Urban for helping us out with that. And then finally, we've got um, this one, which I'll, I'll say is a very, very interesting addition here. So Cabin Vineyard 2015 Bordeaux blend. Um, this is a couple of years old. So we've got, uh, we've got some older wines in here, which is great. Um, Cabin Vineyard is out of Frederick County and uh, pretty much no one has heard of Cabin Vineyard. And we are the first ones that have this wine available because Cabin Vineyard does not sell their wine. And so if you uh, would like to try this wine, and it is a killer Bordeaux blend, um, you, you got to buy it from us. You got to buy it here. This is great. Um, they have a couple of different wines, which uh, they've got a rosé. They've got a couple of different reds. And when we were tasting wines for this, there was uh, a 15, uh, 17, and an 18 red. And as uh, William said, and, and uh, you know, we've heard before, 2018 was one of the worst years on record. And we have some magicians here in the industry. William's one of them. Um, Sugarloaf Mountain Vineyard's another one. We've got a couple of wineries who's recently we've tasted uh, their 2018s, and they're coming out with uh, with some really killer wines. This one, as a 2015, you begin to see some age on it. And a couple of our wineries are beginning to intentionally slow their, their, uh, their, their run of wine so that they can hold on to older vintages. It used to be that wineries would um, almost have to release wines, red wines, as soon as they bottled them, which is not ideal. We're in a situation now where they're able to produce a little bit more and hold on to a vintage a little longer. So here we are six years later and we're able to try a beautifully aged 2015. So um, I can't I can't recommend this uh, this lineup more highly. So I, I encourage people to uh, to get in. Um, uh, two quick comments from our last one. Uh, looks like we've got Damon Callis from Urban, and and not not to uh, uh, not to forget about Georgia, right? Georgia, who's uh, got her hands in, in making all these wines. So Damon and, and Georgia, thanks for sharing that uh, urban winery, bourbon barrel age Merlot. Um, so with that, I wanted to, to move back to our homepage. Um, so this is something that, that in addition to the standard red and white that you can subscribe to, we have begun launching specialty packs. So every quarter when we have our release, uh, we're going through and, and creating a theme pack based on something. So we did a, a holiday pack or a Thanksgiving pack, which had the perfect wines to, uh, to blend in with um, or to pair with the cacophony of flavors that you have with a, a meal like a Thanksgiving or Christmas or, you know, any of the, any of the major holiday meals where you're just putting a lot of different things on the table and hopefully in years future, having a lot of people over to consume. So, in this one, we decided to go back and talk a little bit about the heritage of Maryland wine. And if you think way back to the beginning when Philip Wagner was uh, beginning to import vines and, and start producing uh, wines and began as a nursery selling wines to other people, 
Some of those grapes are still around, not many of them, but some of those grapes are still around and in circulation and being well used. And we wanted to highlight some of those. Uh, you think about the, the history of of uh, who our original winemakers were. Um, you know, you had Bordy and then you had uh, Linganore, who are the two surviving wineries from the 70s. And then in the 80s, you had uh, the likes of, of uh, Woodhall and Bassignani and our, our special guest who's about to join me right now. I'm going to pop on the screen, Mike Fiore. Um, Mike, so glad that you could join us. Oh, thank you for having me, Kevin. Yeah, it's it's great great to see you in the flesh, and uh, we've had some good conversations this week. Um, so as we as we go through here, there, there's a couple of wines that as or a couple of grapes that, as you know, play a major role in the history of our wine industry. One of them is Saval Blanc, and that's one that that uh, we've seen be turned into just about every style of wine. I know when I started, a lot of our wineries still had varietal save all. Some were oak aged, some were aged surly, meaning uh, left with the yeast. Um, some were barrel aged, some were not. Some were sparkling um, and, and uh, some were dessert wines. And so it really has been a, a, a pretty versatile variety. Um, and we've got one which I'll talk about uh, after, after we focus on your wine. Um, then there's Vidal, which is something that you've you've produced in the past. Um, and I, I do you still have a Vidal? Uh, we're going to replant it uh, in the spring. We're going to be putting in a thousand vines. Yeah. So so Vidal's just like we established in Swan Harbor. That yeah. We put, uh, Oh, 1,700, no, no, 7,000 vines, I'm sorry. 7,000 vines of Vidal. I don't know if you remember that. I do. I remember the Swan Harbor Vineyard, yeah. Right. Um, the, 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 ri the rise and fall of the Swan Harbor Vineyard. Right. But yeah. anyway, uh, I wanted to add something on the Saval that you yeah. mentioned, if I may. Uh, when we're talking about Saval, let's don't forget Pam Mowbray. Oh, yeah. Which he was the uh, he is actually a man that actually put Seval well oh, yeah. all over the world. Yep, he got that title from the French as a Chevalier du Vin, and uh, because of uh, the Sevillard that he made it, and he was the only one that actually labeled it Sevillard. Uh, he made the ice wine, the first ice wine that it was ever made, uh, and uh, I think it was in this entire continent. That, with that wine, with the save all, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, and and uh, and and it continues today. You know, there there was about ten years where you hardly saw save all anywhere in Maryland. Um, you know, the, the time was the uh, a number one that uh, yeah. actually uh, there was people like Al Cop. You know, he he raved about save all, and uh, <laughs> this is funny because uh, I'll told uh, Ham Mowbray, he said, your adopted son, Mike Fury, is growing Vidal, and he gave me the dirtiest look. And then I said to him, said, no, 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 hey, Ham, you ought to try that. And he said, after a while, he came back to me and said, damn it, you're the only one that made me drink that wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, quite, that's quite an honor with, with uh, Ham Mowbray on your so, side. So in, in Vidal, Mike, and I'll, I'll mention all this a little bit later, but Vidal is an incredibly uh, versatile grape where you can make clean, crisp, dry. And, and everybody on this uh, who we've had on here uh, has made Vidal or, or currently makes Vidal. And it, it can be dessert wine. It can be late harvest. It can be sparkling. I mean, it, it really is a versatile grape. I could never do a, a nice wine like they do it in Canada. Yeah. It don't matter how long I try, but... What we did very successful, we did a, um, a late harvest Vidal, okay, that which it was uh, not I remember that. nice as the uh, ice wine, but it was a very pleasant wine. I mean, I couldn't make enough of that. Yeah. So when you waited that long to harvest these grapes, uh, the amount of grapes that you get out of, the amount of juice that you get out of, it's, you know, little, you know, it's not that much. Yeah, well, and, and and that's that's what happens when you're when you're doing the late harvest and those berries are starting to dry and and shrivel up. Um, but Mike, listen, you're you're here because you have grown a reputation uh, 
well beyond Maryland and our borders as the king of Chamberson. And, and I've, I've heard your name and we've, we've talked about it. I've heard your name when traveling all over the place. And I say, I'm from Maryland. They say, oh, you know, that Mike Fiore guy who, who makes that killer Chamberson. And uh, you've, you've, you've blended it. You've made straight Chambersons. And you were one of the first ones in the industry to begin holding back the wines so that they're aging. And by the time they get out, they're incomparable in terms of the, the complexity and the depth. You know, I'm not, I, I, I go from being um, forgetful about my wines and leaving them places um, to, to being uh, a bit too quick to open bottles. And so it's, it's refreshing to walk into your winery a couple of weeks ago and see 2012s and 2014s. And these are new releases. These are things you're just bringing out. Well, we keep it two and a half years in oak. Okay, uh, that's how I uh, that's how I age this wine. And uh, you know, of course, I also hold on for at least a year before I release it. So you've got to be at least a three and a half years from harvest by the time it gets out on the market. So, uh, but it's worth it because uh, I'm getting the price that I want for it, and. Uh, uh, I have customers that are very dedicated on it, and now how much I'm selling, you know, as soon as I release it, you know, that uh, they're waiting for it. But uh, the greatest compliment I've ever got on uh, on uh, Chambersan, it was uh, I was on a panel one time with uh, Dick Naylor, which and by the way I, I owe everything to Dick. Dick is the guy that introduced me to Chambersan, and. Um, uh, he inspired me on planting Chambersan and going on with it. Uh, it was a trio over here down Southern Pennsylvania, Northern Maryland, me from Northern Maryland, two from Southern Pennsylvania, Dick and uh, John Crouch. And, uh, you know, we sort of uh, uh, admired each other's work. And uh, anyway, Dick introduced me to Chambersan. But I was on a panel with uh, uh, Dick Naylor and uh, Steve Shepard, at the time, he was uh, running a winery in uh, Pennsylvania, and I was in uh, North Carolina, and uh, and me, and uh, you know, uh, I didn't want to <laughs> over brag on this, but when they drank my uh, when they drank my Chambersan, and so everybody you know braved in the audience, Emily Johnston, <laughs> she got up and said, "I want all of you to know." That that chamber scent is from Maryland. <laughs> well, and, and there I've been in a couple of rooms where people have have uh, banged their chest with pride because of tasting this Chamberson. So, Mike, tell me tell me a little bit about Chamberson because I, when I first got into the industry, I knew Cabernet, I knew Merlot, you know, I knew the basic Burgundy and Bordeaux and and some of the Italian varieties. When I tasted Chamberson. Um, to me, it was, uh, you know, as William said about Norton, it, it had this earthiness, this complexity, you know, this red fruit, cherry berry. I mean, it can, it can be a lot of things, but yours has really been consistent over the years. Tell us about it. When I was introduced to Chambersan, I mean, as I was saying before, Dick Neller introduced me to Chambersan, I, um, I felt there was something missing in it, okay? Um, the acids weren't quite the way my palate would want them to be. So uh, I wanted to find out why, and I had no a way to be able to separate those acids, okay? And uh, finally, I ran into a gentleman, oriental guy from uh, Bethesda, I think it was, and uh, he had uh, equipment that he could actually separate. And he was telling me, he said, you know, most of that acid you got in here is malic. I said, whoa, that is my problem. You know, because once you get this wine into a melodic uh, fermentation, uh, the wine is, was nothing. You know, it was like going through. Uh, and if you had a tartaric acid at that time, it really didn't do it. The secret was into uh, what we find out later on into keeping the grapes on the vine as long as they were standing. And uh, the pH, of course, was pretty bad, but then boost the pH up with tartaric acid. To a point that uh, you know it was uh, uh, palatable, 
And uh, he actually he worked out pretty good. Now, by introducing an early melolatic culture into it, and it was a little the fermentation early in the game, uh, really did the job, okay? Now it's just a matter of time, you know, just a matter of waiting. You know, it's just a matter of uh, uh, doing various testing. But another thing that I did with Chambre Sand, when I didn't know that what to what to do in order to uh, replace all this uh, malic acid with, with tartaric acid, I used a system that was very popular in the Veneto area of Italy. Now, don't forget, I'm a Southern Italian, okay? Uh, <laughs> I mean, but I knew what those Venetian did in order to achieve the final result that they wanted to. And I said, well, if they can do it there, I can do it here. Well, what kind of grape is available to me? It's Cabernet Sauvignon, which unfortunately, Chambre ripes a lot earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. Right. But what I did is I let the hanging on the vine until the Cabernet Sauvignon was <laughs> Uh, harvest and uh, you know fermented and pressed. And then I would take the skins of the Cabernet Sauvignon and I would lay it down and I crush the Chambresan over the top of it. And I'm more or less in a Mike Fury's way. I did some sort of a ripasso like. Okay, uh, it wasn't really ripasso. But we are doing ripasso now with Chambresan and uh, a pasito. Uh, but uh, you know that was a different. You know, a, a modified, uh, call it repasso, the way I did it. But it worked. I picked up enough uh, uh, tartaric acid out of those um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon skins that he carried me through. And matter of fact, I think I remember one time, uh, Carol Wilson, she asked me, said, do you have Cabernet in there? I said, no, Carol, not even a drop. I said, man, I really love this wine, but you've got something else. I said, no, no, not even a drop. I said, what I got in here is the Cabernet Sauvignon skins that they carry me to what I wanted to do. Okay. Well, I, I got a, a gold medal on that uh, Pacific Rim competition on that, which it was rare then back in them, them days that a French harbor would do that. And uh, then uh, uh, I think it was the year after I got the Governor's Cup over here model. Yeah. And Mike, we're, we're going to have to make everybody who has viewed this sign a non-disclosure agreement because you basically just gave your playbook, gave your secrets on how to make this wine. Uh, not all of them. <laughs> no. Okay, good. So you still got some secrets in there. Oh, yeah. But, hey, actually, if I can help anybody, I mean, I, I remember a lot of people, most of the Virginians, they used to come after me like you don't believe. I mean, they were to know, you know, how I would do this. And actually, I even brought it down step by step to one guy, what I did to, you know, certain grapes with the vines to, to, to do that. And, um, you know, some of those guys made some fantastic wines. And I'm glad they did because that's the name of the game. Be able to improve uh, your product and be able to see that somebody else can benefit out of it. You know, that that's... Uh, to me, make me very happy, you know. So uh, well, that was my chambers. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and Mike, I have to, I have to thank you very much for for sharing this um, because it's 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 really great to have this because I think as part of our a part of any of our wine packs, it tells a great story. But specifically and particularly as part of our Maryland Heritage Pack, um, this this is you know there are a bunch of wineries that make Chamberson. Um, but this really has become, you know, a benchmark in the industry. So thank you very much for joining us. And, and please. Well, one piece of advice yeah. that I'd like to give to everybody that, uh, you know, don't ever, ever put sugar in Chambersane to cover up the bad acid you have in it. Okay. Don't, don't do that because you can spot it eventually. Uh, maybe you might be able to fool some of the people some of the time, but you'll never fool all the people all the time. You really, connoisseurs of wines, it will pick up that sugar a mile away. So don't do that. Cure, cure that the acid. Cure the acid with acid. Don't cure. Mike, so it sounds like we need to have a separate seminar specifically about uh, downloading all of your tips. So let's do that. If I can help anybody, I gladly do it. Well, Mike. Listen, th thank you for joining us. We're, we're going to jump on to some of the next wine. Say hi to Rose and Tony and everybody there. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. So uh, just, just briefly to wrap up some of these wines that we have 
on the uh, in the Maryland Heritage Pack. I was going to say the the Heritage Pack. It's a Maryland Heritage Pack. Um, so we we talked about uh, about Save All Blanc. So it's begun to see a resurgence in Maryland. Uh, th there's a, a really really nice uh, sparkling Save All that I've recently had from Bassignani Winery. I've seen Save All in some blends uh, recently. And Bordy Vineyards just re-debuted its Seval this time as a spritz, and they call it spritz. And I've got uh, a bottle of it here, which I will uh, bring up so you can see it. Um, it it's just it's a really clean, crisp label. Uh, the the green uh, art and lettering on there is kind of indicative of what you're going to try. It's this really, really bright wine, and it's delicious. Uh, there's just just enough in the way of bubbles to make it a really exciting wine to try. And uh, we're thrilled to have it as, as part of this pack because I think just as Mike talked about Chamberson being the kind of original, one of the original native or not native, but hybrid red grapes, in addition to uh, Foch and Chancellor and, and Chaloy or Shawa, however you want to say it. Um, and Leon Mio. I mean, there's some old grape varieties that are still in circulation, um, but are generally used in blends. Seval and Chamberson are, are still stars. And then finally, we were thrilled to see a wine from Lynxbridge Vineyard in Frederick County called Vichard. And it is just as the name might imply, it is a blend of Vidal and Chardonnay. Uh, the Vidal is coming from Golden Run Vineyards on the Eastern Shore, Jenny Schmidt and family. And, uh, and, and the Chardonnay is coming from Lynxbridge Vineyard itself. And this is this is great. You, the reason we did this, you can find a whole bunch of Vidal Blancs around the state. And we encourage you to uh, go search for them because they're beautiful. Just just know what it is you're looking for, whether you're looking for um, you know, a, a dry or an off dry or a sweet because they come in just about every style. This Vichard is a beautiful table wine, and it's uh, medium body, but extremely bright and fresh. And we were excited to find it because I don't think I had seen a Vidal Chardonnay blend before. I've seen those two in with a bunch of other grapes, just creating a, a white. But but this is this the two of these play you know equally uh, starring roles in this wine, and it's very exciting. So we've got this heritage pack, which includes uh, a, a Chardonnay, or excuse me, a, a Vidal Chardonnay blend, the Chamberson. I'll go back up here just so you can see the photo and uh, and the Bordy Spritz. So very excited about that. And it's a steal at only 65 bucks. Um, it, it's great because uh, the Fury wines, a 2012 to things that you're um, drinking, you know, an eight, eight and a half year old wine um, is wild. So um, with that, just one last encouragement, uh, get, get on our site and, and try these wines, try the pack. There's no long-term commitment. Um, if you want to get the, uh, get the discount and the flat rate shipping, go ahead and subscribe. You can cancel anytime you want, but it's, it's a great deal. Uh, and we're taking the hard work out and we're driving around to get the wines for you. So you don't need to, um, I see a comment from Cheryl here, Cheryl, good to see you and, and hear from you. Um, the spritz is awesome. So uh, uh, looking forward to hearing what you think of it. So with that, we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. And I want to thank everybody for joining us, William Layton, Bob White, Mike Fury, uh, for sharing their wisdom and, and telling us what's going on at the vineyards. And to all of you out there in uh, Maryland wineland, cheers.